Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. Grab your song books, please. Turn to page 295. Page 295. Wonderful words of life. Page 295, let's all stand. Sing it with me. Sing them over again to me. Wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty. Teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Second Samuel chapter 18, and I sort of began it a little bit, but we'll start from the beginning. I got into a few verses, but I do have my notes now on it. Actually, my printer ran out of ink and doesn't warn me, <laughs> and usually I have some extra, but I didn't, so I had to write up my notes this morning, which is probably better because uh, sometimes I think... I can follow them better when I write them up rather than print them. Okay, Second Samuel chapter 18. Let's go to the Word in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, once again we do thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we're thankful for your Word. We're thankful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and that he redeemed us, Father, and, and paid the great price for our sin, Father, and, and uh, gave us a new life, Father. And, and Lord, we just pray, God, that as we open your word today, God, that you'd bless us, Lord. Uh, help us, Lord, to see what you'd have us to see, Father. And we pray, God, that uh, your spirit have rain here, Father. And, and I pray, God, that you'd use me at this time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Second Samuel chapter 18. And again, we were talking about, of course, last week in 17. We know that Absalom uh, uh, basically... Uh, and came in to Jerusalem, and uh, he wants to take, of course, his father's kingdom. And, of course, David was on the run and was warned uh, to cross over to the Jordan and uh, be ready for uh, a battle. And so, again, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, there are so many names. But he was, he was uh, warned of... Uh, Huzzai, Huzzai, I believe it was, or Huzziah, however you pronounce it. And uh, again, uh, again, he was sent there to be really um, back to uh, 
Absalom to be a spy for David. And of course, they use uh, the priest's sons to go and warn David. Uh, Jonathan and Ahimez uh, went to warn David. So again, David was ready uh, for the battle that was going to ensue here. And again, basically, w w what's going on here is, uh, again, Absalom really deceived the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is really siding with Absalom, of course, and when David leaves, David's got his faithful men that have been him with him probably for years. And again, we see this with the nation of Israel over and over again. It, you know, uh, again, David was the king of Israel. Okay, even though Absalom was trying to take it from him, again, Absalom thought it was his righteous place to have it. And again, he didn't like uh, uh, what his father had done in the past. And again, from uh, years prior to that, he had a vendetta against his father. Uh, when uh, Amnon uh, raped Tamos, and from that point on, he, it seemed like Absalom, you know, again, he left, came back. Uh, and uh, from that point on, he uh, was just uh, at aught with his father. And uh, again, David loved Absalom, and we'll see that even from this chapter as we go on and read through. But then, uh, uh, again, Absalom wants to take the kingdom. It's not his place to take this kingdom at this point in time. Of course, David's still alive. And the thing is, God considers him the king, amen? And when God considers you the king, and, and again, I was mentioned in Israel, really, Absalom had deceived Israel. And again, David's got his faithful men and people that followed him. But uh, pretty much on a whole, Israel followed Absalom. Uh, for the most part, we see that with Israel over and over again, that they, you know, go against the things of God. Again, remember when, uh, you know, when Samuel warned them uh, when they wanted a king and God gave them Saul. And he, he, he told Samuel, you know, that, you know, it's not you they rejected, it's me they rejected. And over and over we see that Israel rejected God. Even to the point when the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the, the scene, they reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, again, because their eyes were blinded, because really they didn't want to see the truth. They were out out to seek their own way and their own will. Had they look, been looking to please God and follow after God, which some Jews did, they would have seen who Christ was, and many of them did, and many of them received Christ. But again, it's because, you know, again, this thing reads your heart before, before you read it, amen? Yeah. You look for lies in here, you're going to find lies. You look for the truth and really seeking the truth, God's going to show you the truth and, and teach you some things from the Word of God. And you'll see that often. I mean, even when you deal with people, you'll, you'll, you know, they'll find verses that contradict itself and, and right away in their mind, it can't be the word of God. But the thing is, they're blind to it. That's why Jesus, of course, spoke in parables many times. Is, is so his, the, the believers would hear and understand. But those that uh, didn't believe that Jesus, you know, was God manifest in the flesh? They were confounded by the things Jesus taught. So again, they're uh, Israel here is confounded by Absalom. And Israel, again, when you look at Israel, I've always said this, it's a picture of the life of a Christian for, for the most part. Um, you see Christians and they go up and down and, you know, they're following God for a while and then they... Uh, tend to follow after the flesh and they follow after to get right with God and follow after him. And you'll see that in the book of Kings and, you know, you have a good king, a bad king. And, and that's how, unfortunately, you know, men's tend to be pretty unstable. Amen. That's how come God warns us over and over to stay in the word of God continually that, you know, you might just follow after God and, and uh, that you're, you're, you wouldn't be double-minded in your ways. And of course, Israel, you see them, they're double-minded very often. But anyway, in uh, chapter 18 and verse 1, it says, And David numbered the people that were with him and, the, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. And David sent forth a third of the people under the hand of Joab and a third of the par, uh, part under the hand of um, Bishai, uh, the son of uh, Zariah, Joab's brother, and a third part on the under the hand of Ittai the Gittite. And the king said unto the people, I will surely go forth uh, with you myself also. 
And again, so again, he divides them up into three groups. And again, remember, uh, uh, there David's willing to go with him. And of course, that's where David got in trouble back uh, uh, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 when uh, he stayed back. And that's when he, he saw um, Bathsheba there. And he should have been out there leading, leading the troops and, 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 you know, with the, been there with uh, his warriors in there. But uh, in 2 Samuel 11, 1, and I have the, I have, oh, I'm in 1 Samuel. That's why I turned too many pages. <laughs> um, 2 Samuel 11, 1 is when, uh, again, he stayed back and he got in trouble. Here he's willing to go. And before he just sent Joab in, uh, in chapter 11. Uh, and it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when the kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they uh, destroyed the children of Amnon and besieged Reba. But David... Uh, tarried still at Jerusalem. So again, David uh, stayed back at that point in time, and again, it uh, opens up David uh, to sin with Bathsheba. But anyway, uh, here he's wanting to go forth, and the people there are telling him not to. And in verse 3, it says, But the people answered, Thou shalt not go forth, for if we flee away, uh, they will not care for us, neither if half of us die will they care for us. But now thou art worth 10,000 of us, therefore now it is better that thou succor us out of the city. And, king, uh, and the king said unto them, what seemeth, best, uh, what seemeth you best I will do. And the king stood by the gate, uh, side and all the people came out by hundreds and by thousands. So again, uh, David does have a, a large army here, uh, and uh, so he decides to stay back by the gate side. And uh, verse five it says, and the king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ataiah, saying, "Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom." And all the people heard when the king gave the captain's charge concerning Absalom. Okay, so again, here's David, and David still loves his son Absalom after all he's done to, you know, to King David, and, and uh, he still has a great love, and it shows a father's love for his son. Amen? And, and uh, uh, I mean, that is a great love. And again, it, you know, you think about the father, you know, uh, for, for his son's sakes, he shows us great love. Amen. Amen. And the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, I mean, it's because of his sake, God loves us. And uh, again, him dying for us and being the sacrifice for our sin. But what a great love the father has. And, you know, it wasn't until I became a father when I understood the unconditional love of God. I mean, I, I sort of got it, but when I became a father, I understood it more. And no matter how you have to chase, chastise your children and stuff like that, when, you know, you understand, I mean, it, it, it would grieve me when I had to do it, amen? It would grieve me to chastise my children, but I had to do it because you love your children, you want them to see them do right. But again, it, you, you take no joy in it, you know? If you truly love and you have that right relationship with your children, and that's how it is with God. God desires our fellowship, amen. And David, look at everything that Absalom, you know, taken over the kingdom from him. He's very concerned about uh, Absalom's uh, condition and, and that they deal uh, well with Absalom. Again, he wants, uh, he wants them to show Absalom mercy, and grace, you know, and, uh, and again, Joab doesn't look at it that way, man. And, and again, maybe that's one of the reasons also. They said, David, you stay back because, again, they're, they're fighting against Absalom. They're fighting against his son. And they know, I mean, you, you see where David, when he dealt with Amnon, one of the reasons that uh, 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 Absalom was so upset with David is he didn't deal right with his son when he sinned against Tamar. And, uh, and uh, I mean, Joab and, and the other troops are probably thinking, man, it's better that, that David stay back because 
He's not, if, if, the, if the battle ensued and Absalom was involved in it, David uh, probably would not uh, uh, want to take Absalom's life if it came down to it. Again, so maybe that's one of the reasons they told him to stay back as well. Um, but uh, in verse uh, 6, it says, So the people went uh, into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the wood of Ephraim. And the people of Israel were slain before the servants of David. And there was a great slaughter uh, that day of 20,000 men. For the battle... Uh, for the battle was there scattered over the face of all the country, and the wood devoured more people that day than devoured the sword, or than the sword devoured. And so again, uh, uh, I believe again one of the reason uh, King David's armies uh, probably subdued the armies of Absalom is because again they were probably some of the older uh, warriors, and they probably had. Uh, more experience and not more ex just more experience, but understood the terrain a little bit better than Absalom's army, um, because it said there that the wood devoured more uh, men than than the sword did. And uh, uh, Spurgeon says, perishing not only by the sword, but among the thick oaks and entangled briars of the wood, which conceal fearful pres precipices and great caverns into which plunged. Uh, in their wild uh, fright, the, the route set in. So again, you know, just it was a dangerous territory to be fighting in. And, uh, and so again, if you're not prepared and don't understand the layout of the land and what's going on, it, it can be very dangerous. And again, many lives were lost because of that. I've read also that wild beasts may have taken the lives of many as well, or they'd get wounded and wild beasts would take them after when they couldn't fight at that point in time. And so again, it says there that, you know, many, many more were taken by the wood than, than the sword devoured. So again, it, it had to do, I believe, with uh, David's men were much more skilled and much more uh, uh, knew the lay of the land much better. And this type of thing, again, for those of you that are in the service, you know why they're so, your training is so intensive, amen? And, and uh, when you're getting ready to uh, go into battle and that type of thing. I've never been in the service myself, but I know people that have and have talked to them. But anyway, verse 9, it says, And Absalom met servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between heaven and earth, and the mule that was under him went away. So again, uh, Absalom, he's, uh, uh, again, he rejected the uh, counsel of Ahithophel. Remember, Ahithophel, he just wanted to go and take David's life. And, you know, and sort of avoid the whole battle thing if he could. You know, he's going to look and search out David, take David's life uh, by himself and uh, do it that way. But I think, uh, again, uh, Ahithophel avoided his, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Absalom avoided Ahithophel's advice and decided to go into the battle. And here he is riding a mule into the battle. Again, he, I think it had to do with the vanity of uh of Absalom as well. He wanted to be the proud king, you know, and be victorious over his father's kingdom and, and take it from him in that way. And, and uh, again, you know, he, he, you know, again, it talks about his looks and his height and stuff. And, and, you know, he's a tall man, good looking. And again, he was known for his hair. Amen. And, uh, uh, it's often taught that, you know, that when he went through these oaks that it was his hair that got tangled up in the oaks and he was suspended by his hair. The Bible doesn't really say that. But uh, again, it says that uh, there it was, uh, it says, uh, the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak and his head caught hold of an oak and he was taken up between heaven and earth and the mule was under him went away. So again, he's hanging by his head. Uh, in a great oak. And I was thinking about that. Uh, you know, here he is suspended between heaven and earth. And really, uh, you know, he went against the will of God there. So again, heaven's rejected him. And uh, uh, 
the, he's losing the battle there, so earth is rejecting him as well, and he's hanging there in the mist. And it, may, of course, made me think about the Lord Jesus Christ, too, when he hung on the cross. And again, becoming sin for us, he was a curse, uh, the Bible says, you know, and became uh, sin uh, for us. Again, he, he was... Uh, the Father had to look away when Jesus uh, was on the cross being re rejected uh, of God at that point in time when he became sin because, again, uh, God can't uh, receive him. But, again, by that, him paying the price uh, for sin for us. So I'm just thinking, uh, you know, again, he, he hung between heaven and earth, and, again, he was rejected by the Jews. Uh, again, he came on his own, but his own received him not, and he became sin for us. And uh, uh, in Second Corinthians five twenty one, and then in Isaiah uh, fifty three, in uh, verses ten and ten and eleven, it says, "Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him; he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and he shall." Pro pro prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall uh, see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Okay, so again, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. But I just couldn't help but thinking about him being hung between heaven and earth as, as uh, 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 Absalom was. Of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, for a good reason, Absalom, for de defying the things of God. And... Uh, so anyway, um, it goes on, verse 10, it says, And a certain man saw it and told Joab, And behold, I saw Absalom hanged in an oak. And Joab said unto the uh, man that told him, And behold, thou sawest him, and why didst not, uh, thou not smite him to the ground? And I would have given thee ten shekels of silver and a girdle. So again, Joab's basically, I would have given you a reward. The ten shekels of silver would have been a reward, but a girdle would have been been a, a reward. And not only that, it, it had to do with promotion in the army. There, he would have been promoted in his position, and a girdle would have been the the sign that you know he was uh, moved up in in uh, in a, a different. Uh, category of, of uh, servants to uh, Joab. Again, Joab's the captain of the army at this point in time, and again, he could have done that. But this man here, this is uh, verse 12, and the man said to Joab, Thou, though I should receive thousand shekels of silver in my hand, yet would I not put forth mine hand against the king's son. For in our hearing the king charged thee, and Abishai, and Attiah, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Okay, so again, uh, this man was uh, going by the word of the king, amen. The king ordered him to do uh, not to touch Absalom, not to hurt Absalom, but again, uh, and he said, though you give me 10,000 pieces of shekels or whatever it was, 1,000 pieces of shekels, 1,000 uh, shekels of silver, he says, I, I wouldn't put forth my hand, amen? So again, it's a great thing. It makes, of course, me think of David when David also had the opportunity to take Saul's life. And again, he knew that it was not time yet. And this is how that man's looking again, uh, talking about the authority that he was under by the king again. You know, God put, put David in authority, so it's best to take the word of God's man and go by, you know, the man that God puts in authority. It's best to listen to him and, and, uh, and be obedient to him at that point in time, you know. And, God, and I mean, when you study the Bible, you see how he puts different men in authority, brings them up, and, and, and we're told to be obedient unto them until someone actually crosses what the Scripture is. Is there someone's in authority? If they tell you to go against the Word of God, that's when you go against them. Amen. But, if, but if they're abiding by God's Word, amen, you just, you know, if it's in line with it, you need to be obedient, amen? And uh, that's the way it should be. And so, again, uh, he said, Beware that none touch the young man, Absalom, verse 13, it says, Otherwise I should, ha I should have wrought falsehood against mine own life, for there is no matter hid from the king, and thou thyself wouldest have set 
thyself against me. And so again, he's looking that Joab would have come against him as well um, if he would have been disobedient to the king. Again, and for Joab, you know, then he could have pointed at this man rather than uh, taking uh, the brunt of the blame for it from the king. But again, it goes on to say, Then said Joab, I may not tarry thus with thee. And he took three darts in his hand and thrust them in the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Absalom and slew him. And I know I mentioned several times that Joab killed Absalom. And I, he, he didn't actually die by the hand of Joab. I mean, Joab smote him with three darts, but it's the ten young men that took him and actually smote him. So Joab, uh, uh, it was his idea. I mean, it's almost like uh, we think of uh, the Apostle Paul when, when uh, Stephen was killed. And we actually... Stephen gave the, or Paul, Saul at the time, gave the order for Stephen to be killed. And again, that's why one of the reasons why uh, Saul talked about him being uh, uh, such a sinner that he was. And again, because again, he would uh, uh, fight the church, fight against the church that God had established. And then, and of course, he was saved and he repented of that. But again, Joab. It was Joab's idea. Joab wanted him dead. And I, I understand Joab's purpose there because, again, Absalom's been a thorn in the side to David and would continue to be probably if he lived. And I understand that where Absalom's coming from, but again, it's against the king's wishes and he's going directly against what the king had said. It would have been something that David would have had to deal with. But, I mean, Joab as a warrior and, and this type of thing thought, well, I'll just take care of the problem once and for all and uh, have him killed or, or, you know, he was part of the process. Joab was again, it says he, he, he thrust him with uh, uh, the, the darts in the heart of Absalom. It's probably the midsection of Absalom. And again, it looks like that's not exactly what actually killed him. He probably would have died anyway, but it says, and 10 young men that bear Joab's armor compassed about and smote Am Absalom and, and slew him. So they probably pulled him from the tree and beat him to death, is what I'm thinking. And uh, after he was had the darts uh, thrust into him. So, uh, uh, and I was thinking about that, and uh, maybe, maybe the 10 young men killed him because of the Ten concubines that Absalom took of David's, you know, when, when he had no business doing. But again, Ahithophel told him to just to, uh, again, we know it fulfilled uh, part of the, the punishment of David's sin against Bathsheba, where God warned him of this thing that would be done openly. But, uh, uh, you know, you have the ten concubines that Absalom took and, and committed sin with, and then. Uh, again, you have these 10 young men taking his life. And uh, in verse 17, it says, And they took Absalom and cast him in a great pit in the wood and laid a very heap, uh, great heap of stones upon him. And all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Now Absalom in his lifetime had taken and reared up for himself a pillar, which is the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in remembrance. And he called the pillar after his own name. And it is called unto this day Absalom's place. Again, so he, Absalom took this uh, pillar and he made it while he was alive. He says, I have no son uh, to keep my name in remembrance. But again, in uh, 2 Samuel 14, 27, uh, we see that Absalom had three sons there. So, um, in 27, it says, And unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar, and she was a woman of fair countenance. So it mentions her name, but it doesn't give the son's name. And uh, I would assume that his sons had died at that, uh, somehow in... in uh, that at one point, maybe it was because of the death of his sons that, again, he, maybe it was at that point he decided to make this pillar, okay, because he had no sons. So we really don't know why, uh, 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 
or what had happened to his sons. Okay, but it says he had them, but there it says he didn't have any sons, so apparently they, they uh, died before him. And, uh, okay, let me find my place here. Okay, and uh, verse 19, it says, Then said Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. And Joab said unto him, Thou shalt not bear the tidings this day, but thou shalt bear the tidings another day. But this day thou shalt bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. So again, uh, uh, Ahimaaz, he's the son of the priest, Zadok. And again, Joab tells him not to bear the king tidings. He, uh, again, didn't want, I believe he's keeping... Uh, uh, Ahimaaz from bearing bad tidings unto the king because Ahimaaz uh, really was a friend of David and uh, again the son of the priest and remember uh, uh, it was Ahimaaz that it was one of the ones with Jonathan warned David of the impending uh, battle against uh, David so again uh, uh, Joab said unto him, You stay back. In verse 21, he said, Then said Joab to Cushai, uh, Go tell the king that what thou hast seen. And Cushai bind himself uh, unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimez, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, But not, but however, howsoever, let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai. And Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever, said he, let me run. And he said unto him, Run. And him as ran by the way in the plain and overran Cushai. And David sat uh, between two gates, and the watchman went up uh, to the roof over the gate unto the wall and lifted up his eyes and looked, and, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried. And told the king, and the king said, if, if he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came uh, apace and drew near. And the watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to, uh, unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, uh, Me thinketh the running of the foremost is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, he is a good man and cometh with good tidings. So again, the king's looking, said, he's a good man. He's going to bring me some good news. And again, I think him as, of course, probably loved the king, you know, and uh, being the son of Zadok. And again, they were always on the side of David. And it says, and him as called and said unto the king, all is well. And he fell down upon uh, his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my Lord the king. And the king said, Is a young man Absalom safe? And Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. So again, uh, King David's first first thing, uh, you know, question is is the uh, is the young man safe? Is is Absalom safe? He was concerned about his son again. Great love for his son uh, was, uh, you know, uh, and, and again, again, it just makes me think the love that God has towards us, no matter what we may do and where we may go and. And how, time, how many times you turn against God, that God will uh, still be merciful to you and be willing to take you back when you repent. You know? And again, you see that great love that David had towards his son. No matter what Absalom done, he was concerned about him. He loved him and cared for him. Amen. And it is a great picture of, uh, of God the Father and us, amen, because again, we, you know, we tend to be in rebellion towards God in, in many stages in our life, and, and uh, uh, well, like, uh, but anyway, we'll go on, uh, 
But anyway, verse 31 said, And behold, Cushi came, and Cushi said, Tidings, my lord the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day, and all the men that rose up against thee. And the king said to Cushi, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king, and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt, be as a young man is. And what a way to tell him that Absalom is dead. And, and the thing was, again, there again, you see the love that David had for Absalom. Is a young man safe? Is a young man safe? He asked that question over and over and uh, was really concerned about Absalom. And, uh, and, uh, and he says, uh, I like the way he worded that. He said, against thee do, uh, it says, and all that rise against thee that do thy hurt be as the young man is, letting him know that he, he had died. In verse 33, and the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as uh, he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Amen. And uh, again, I think about that and how the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. Amen. Amen. And uh, what a great thing it is that we, again, through that we can have uh, eternal life. There's another... Uh, thing when I'm thinking about Joab and uh, in First uh, Kings 2, 5 and 6, and again, David, many times, I don't think he was pleased with Joab's behavior and different things that Joab did. Again, Joab, when you look at Joab and see the life of Joab, uh, he seemed to be a man out for himself and, and, you know, he wanted to make sure his position was always going to be there and, uh, and, uh, I mean, even there's a couple times when, uh, uh, even when Absalom took it and it talked about, he took, uh, I'm trying to think it was last week, the name of the man, uh, he made him chief over the army instead of Joab, it said. Again, Joab had been, you know, the captain over the army of Israel. And uh, it looks like when I read that, it made me think, that Joab may have went wherever he would have been promoted, possible. I'm not sure, but uh, I'm trying to think what verse that was. But anyway, in 2 Kings, before I go back there, in 2 Kings, in uh, chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, um, this is when David uh, uh, is basically dying, and he's talking to Solomon, and he he basically warns him about Joab, and he says, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zariah, did to me, and what he did uh, to the two captains of the host of Israel, unto Abner, the son of Ner, and unto Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he slew and shed blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war upon his girdle that was about his loins, and in his shoes were... Uh, that were on his feet. And again, remember, uh, uh, Joab got the position of being the captain by uh, taking Israel or taking Jerusalem when, uh, when uh, David first became king and, and uh, Joab fought and basically David told him, uh, you know, or put a decree out there, whoever takes it, I'll make him captain of the army. And that's how Joab got it, the position, and he remained there uh, from that point on. But I don't think, uh, uh, I know that David was not always pleased with Joab. And again, he's warning uh, uh, Solomon of Joab. But I'm looking for the one verse where uh, he, uh, where Absalom appoints uh I believe it's one of Joab's cousins it was to be the captain over the army, over Joab's army, instead of Joab. And uh, again, I can't find the verse. It was in chapter 17. But by that, I'm thinking that, you know, Joab, prob because of that verse, that Joab probably would have went and fought against David's men 
and being the captain over Israel if it profited him in any way. So, and again, uh, I don't know that for sure, but again, when I look at the character of Joab, Joab just seems to be a man looking out for himself, and that's all he cares about. He doesn't care about the will of God. He's not a man that would followed after God. He's following after David. The only reason I believe he followed after David and became captain there is because uh, David was victorious in many of his battles. So again, it was a great position for Joab to be in, but it's because, you know, he was, he was just a, a, a warrior, liked to fight. And again, he had, you know, he would kill when he thought he should kill and, and this type of thing. And even, you know, again, goes against uh, uh, the will of David there by actually uh, taking Absalom's life. So anyway, I'm going to end there today and then next week we'll go on. And again, we can hear, see here that David is mourning for Absalom, his son. Again, he loved him, even though... He sinned against his father. David still had a great love for Absalom. And, uh, but we'll pray and be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we do thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we're thankful for uh, your book. And Lord, we just pray that you bless the service to come, Father. Again, we ask that uh, you give our pastor uh, uh, the words to uh, speak on us, Father. And pray again that uh, all things would be done for your honor and glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah.